Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to this uh, panel. Uh, on behalf of Marine Corps University, uh, the Norwegian Defense University College, and Marine Corps University Foundation, welcome to this week's Arctic Security Symposium. Uh, it's an uh, inaugural series exploring the policies, strategies, and tactics underpinning security in the high north. I'm your host, uh, Lieutenant, uh, Lieutenant Colonel Jörn Twitter. I am a military faculty advisor here at the Command and Staff College. Um, I'm also the co-founder of the Arctic uh, Strategic Initiative here at Marine Corps University, uh, and also responsible for an elective here at Command and Staff College called uh, the Arctic Security and Cold Weather Operations. Uh, so before um, uh, before we begin, um, I um, should uh, remind you all about uh, that the opinions expressed here uh, are those of the individual and do not necessarily reflect the views of the Marine Corps University, Norwegian Defense University College, or any other agency of the U.S. or Norwegian government. We will be recording this panel for the benefit of those of, uh, in our community of interest who cannot join us today. So we ask you uh, to be mindful of keeping your microphones muted to avoid disrupt uh, disrupting the presentations, as well as turn off your uh, webcams uh, to help us uh, stream smoothly. Um, at the conclusion of our guest presentations, we will have a, a question and answer session. So if you have questions, please type it in the, the group chat and we will ask the questions to the panel on your behalf. Please note that we will only accept questions uh, via WebEx chat and that the Facebook live stream will not be active for the questions and answers uh, portion. And I'm very uh, excited to introduce our guests, uh, Colonel uh, Daniel Whitman. Uh, we have Lieutenant Colonel uh, uh, Anthony Johnson here and uh, with us, um, uh, virtually, we have uh, Major Knut Hummelwald. Welcome all. Thank you. Uh, I will start by introducing uh, Colonel uh, Whitnam, uh, that is the uh, commanding officer of the uh, Marine Corps um, Mountain Training uh, Warfare Center. Uh, he was commissioned in April 1995 as an infantryman. He uh, conducted the Army uh, Infantry Captain Career Course in 2002. He commanded the company during Operation Iraqi Freedom in March 2003. Uh, he attended the Naval Command Staff College in Newport in 2008. He was the future operation officer of the 5th Marine Regiment uh, in 2011 in Afghanistan. And he commanded the 3rd Battalion, 7th Marines uh, in 2013. He uh, attended the Eisenhower School at the National Defense University in 2016, and he assumed command of uh, the Marine Corps Mountain Warfare Training Center in, uh, in July 2020. And also then, uh, Lieutenant Colonel Anthony Johnson um, uh, went to the basic school in 2000, uh, attended the Maneuver uh, Captain Career Course in 2007, and the Naval Postgraduate School in 2015. He was the company commander of 2nd Battalion, 6th Marines, and also the commanding officer of the 1st Battalion, 8th Marines. Um, last year, he was uh, a faculty advisor here at Command Staff College, um, and a colleague of mine, and he helped me out uh, with the uh, Command Staff College elective Cold Weather Operations. Uh, he deployed with the Marine Rota uh, Rotational Force Europe to Norway uh, in the winter of 2018-2019, and he is currently at the uh, National War College as a student. Welcome. And uh, virtually, we have uh, Major Knut Tumerwald. Uh He is the branch head of education and training at the Center of Excellence Cold Weather of Operations, uh, and he has been that for six years now. He has a, a uh, long experience as an, a cold weather instructor. instructor. He has uh, about 11 years of uh, experience as a com company commander uh, for different companies uh, and uh, served in different mechanized battalions uh, for more than uh, those years. 
Um, he has been an instructor at the Army Military Academy, and he has been deployed to Afghanistan. Um, the Center of Excellence, uh, Cold Weather Operations, um, has its own comprehensive uh, cold weather seminar as we speak, um, unfortunately. Uh, and, and I'm very excited that uh, you have uh, this, uh, this um, seminar going on in, in Elbrun in Norway uh, right now. Uh, and there's a lot of other things going on uh, over uh, in Norway uh, for you, uh, Knut. Um, preparing, of, of course, for the, the big exercise coming up, the Cold Response 2022, uh, which QMAP will participate in. Um, and then, of course, then receiving all the international uh, participation and training them up for the cold weather. So uh, we will... Um, we will start then um, uh, with um, uh, Major Knut Tumerwald. Uh, uh, I had tasked him to present uh, something uh, on the line of how to train allies for operating in the Arctic, the Norwegian and NATO perspective. Please, Knut. Madam Sir, sirs, um, good afternoon from Edbrum, Norway. Uh, but just uh, finished our own uh, cold weather operations seminar uh, with 300 participants from 19 different countries here in Edrim these last three days. So uh, it's a pleasure to, and it's an honor to be invited to participate in your seminar as well. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to talk about how to train allies for operating in the Arctic, the Norwegian and NATO perspective. I have a few slides that I want to go over. So next slide, please. Uh, what I'm going to talk about is, uh, first of all, uh, challenges of winter. Just going to go through that. What does keep, uh, general winter impose on us? And then uh, some uh, points about what is cold weather capable. And then I'm going to talk about some of the experiences he has through the training ad with allied units in Norway. And last, something about education and possibilities. Next slide, please. Uh, by the way, what I'm talking about is not linked to any unit level. Uh, the points should be valid at all levels, I guess, but my points will mainly focus on the land perspective. The challenges that we are facing in cold weather operations, uh, not prioritized in any order, there are a lot. For instance, navigation movements, the snow reshapes nature and battlefield, wipes out terrain features, we have precipitation, heavy snow, showers, darkness up here in the north at least uh, for most of the day. And just moving in the terrain, this snow is difficult both for humans and for vehicles. And then we have avalanches. Right? Normally avalanches occur in 30 in terrain steeper than 30 degrees, but the runoff zone can run further out than 30, 20 degrees. And remember that a slope only five meters high is actually able to kill a person. So that's the threat we need to take into consideration. Ice could be a challenge. It could um, may have slippery roads and a slippery terrain. Just difficult for vehicles and terrain to be moving, both, uh, both vehicles and, and personnel and foot actually. But also ice could uh, give us some opportunities. can open up new avenues of approach if you know how to do it and have the skills. And then we have food and hydration. That is, that's actually what is really important is that we need even more food and more water in the winter. And water and food tends to freeze. So that gives us some issues. And hygiene. We tend to live closer together when it's cold. And uh, more people are sick. And um, it's harder to keep up the hygiene because water again freezes. And keep, just keeping up the fighting capabilities is hard in the winter. So soldiers need more food, more sleep, more water, and the units need more resources for everything, more or less. Fuel, ammunition. So we need to keep up our fighting capabilities and harder in the winter. Maintenance is harder in the winter. Everything gets cold. Uh, weapons, vehicles, everything. And they have to use the right lubricants, for instance. Can't use normal lubricant that you use in the summertime. You need to be winterproof. And then the risk of cold weather injuries is always present when you're outside when it's cold. And don't have to be too cold, actually. You can know? have cold weather injuries in plus 8 degrees. Of course, I'm talking Celsius, so I don't know what that's Fahrenheit, but that's fairly warm 
the ball freezing. But what, maybe the most important thing for our staff officers and leaders is that everything takes <coughs> more time in the winter, so we need to plan for more time. Next slide, please. So how do we meet these challenges? I think this slide is more in the prioritized order of what's the most important. I would say the most important thing is leadership. We, we do the same in the summer and in the winter, but leadership is much more demanding and more challenged in the winter. So therefore, you need to focus, especially on the junior leaders, lead by intent and trust the leaders in the front facing the environment and the enemy. Next point, discipline and routine. The soldiers need to do the right things all the way, all, also when nobody's watching. And routines, control routines, it's really important. It must be based on the unit, collective training level, equipment, and mission. So there are different routines for different units. You can't say that this is the routines for winter, because a special operations squadron from uh, has different than, for instance, uh, communication units, totally different control routines. The routines should say who, what, where, when, and how. And this requires presence and continuous follow-up of routines. Then there are practical training, knowledge, skill, and attitude. And of those three, I, my opinion, is that attitude is the most important thing. And you need to focus on the basic skills that need to be settled first. And remember that uh, actually it's the quote that uh, from a guy that was in your room now, the general, yeah, Rick said that winter service is a collective skill. Everybody needs the training at their level. And the last two points is often the one we're discussing. That's the equipment point. I would say that correct use of the equipment is much more important than having the right or correct equipment. Next slide, please. So what is called weather capable? A comparison of articles and literature done by the, the Norwegian Defense Research Institute points out three factors needed to be, uh, to be had to be capable for covert operations. The first point is the technology must withstand the weather and the unit needs sufficient equipment. The next point is that the soldier must be able to take care of themselves and keep their equipment operational. The last point, leaders and planners must understand the limitations that the weather gives, but also make use of the possibilities. So all these factors, units can train officers and soldiers and planners, but equipment is a slow process. It needs the movement from other agencies that tells us something uh, about planning and preparations. If a unit normally doesn't have COVID gear, we must plan for it in time to get it and we need to verify that it actually is COVID uh, prepared. There are not stories, stories of uh, vehicles with uh, the wrong hydraulic oil or diesel without the winter identities. No the equipment before you deploy to the COVID area. That's equally important. You have to know the equipment before you deploy. And it comes to COVID care. Food, sleep, hydration are even more important in the cold weather than to become resilient to the COVID injuries. And equipment is what makes it possible to exist in cold climate. We're not meant to live here. So the importance of maintaining and caring for it should be, should be stressed enough. Most units are quite good at maintaining their unit equipment, but uh, often personal equipment are less taken care of. Having the dry insulation, drying stuff, this must be daily routine. And the end state for being called the capable to not be surviving the cold weather, but they should be able to successfully take advantage of the cold weather environment during operations and be better than your enemy. Next slide, please. So this slide shows in a kind of schematic way how to get cold weather capable. Um, Note that uh, survive, operate, master skills on the left hand side, I guess. The, the Marines normally call it uh, survive move type, the same thing. And the right side, you have, uh, have the indicated level of how much time you pursue for training. Those are the basic skills, being able to survive. 
Twenty for basic individual training, personal assistance uh, conversation, and some exposure training. And then you go on to the basic unit training, the program that is used for the UCC several times. Then it goes on to more advanced training, and during this training you have longer and longer exposure to the to the environment. That brings the unit to a level where it can take full advantage of the possibilities that the winter and, and the cold weather gives, such as the ability to move over frozen lakes and rivers, moving to deep terrain, the use of heavy snowfall to infiltrate your ice cream units, and so on. So what does it really mean to be cold weather capable? You're able to adopt the environment and solve your mission. And the ability to solve the mission is not dramatically affected by the weather. Next slide, please. Some experience I had for my years of training with the um, American and British and Dutch and other units. See that at some point there. You see that often the ambitions of the commanders are too high. They see the unit actually training level or equipment or whatever. So they want to get as far as possible, and that means often when you train that you have to take one or maybe two or even three steps back when you do the training. So you need to start falling, walking, and walking. Equipment. A couple words when it comes to equipment. Government issued equipment are normally not top notch, but normally sufficient. It's much, much more important to know how to use the equipment. So and I can say that I see any equipment that has stopped the new And then the impact the weather and the environment has. We have a saying in Norway that things are key, but directly translated to English, that's actually a triple T as well, that things take time. That means that you plan for more time. Preparations for movement, for resupply, etc. Everything will take more time. Wheel-based logistics, you need to clear the road before. Um, you need more logistics. The impact of attempts. Transportation uh, like snow can greatly reduce uh, sensors, but cold clear weather can actually enhance them. And then the effect of cargo, you need more shells to achieve the same effect that you do in summer up to 30% more. At some point you will realize that the weather actually dictates your course of action and decides how, when, and where you will solve it. And then risk assessment. You see that risk assessment, normally units, Norwegian as well, are quite good at doing the risk assessments before they do any activity. But if you take that risk assessment out in the field, that is a difficult part, to do continuous risk assessment. The weather will change, and the, what, what the risk to force will change. And avalanche happens, that will come and go, things will come and go. And another important thing is abort criteria. You need to have defined abort criteria that is known by everybody. And also what to do if that abort criteria hits you. And the last two points, maybe the most important point. Individual skills. I talked about attitude being the most important thing. Doing the right thing when no one's watching. Suck it up. Or, as I heard the Marines say, embrace the suck. Sorry, gentlemen, doesn't work in the risk. Uh, sucking it up might work if it's cold at night, warm at day, but here in the Arctic, it's cold at night and cold at day. So you can't wait till the sun gets up and warm you up. Sucking up will only end up in getting an injury. So um, this attitude thing is hard to teach the soldiers. Um, can't kind of schedule a class of attitude training. So I think the best way is to for the instructors to be good examples and role models. And um, I think that is the best way of doing that. And of course, all the other routines we have also, uh, after a while, great attitudes. And then last point, leadership and communication. Welcome and encourage the initiative at local level, even down to individual soldiers. I've seen enough soldiers sitting in the, sitting in the vehicles, the snow is pouring down, covering everything, and the soldiers are not doing anything about it, because they're not allowed to, to dismount. And I've passed, seen soldiers pass through tents that have almost been flat on the ground because the snow is so, so heavy. So no, it doesn't do anything about it, because it's not their job. 
So having an initiative all the way down to the each and every soldier is important. So you should lead by intent and listen to the junior leaders in the front and in the environment. And you should train the soft skill, soft leadership skills, I'm told. Uh, I've heard that expression. And create a two way dialogue. The soldiers must trust their leaders and be able to tell if they have a problem. If not, they will end up as patient. The next slide, please. Just some um, commercial support for Central Excellence for Education. We are running a lot of courses, my branch. For instance, in two weeks, we'll run a course for 80 Marines. Uh, going to the college songs next um, next win this winter and in January we'll run for 80 more. So we have a lot of international students on our courses. First international students all the way back in 1927. So we have avalanche courses, survival courses, uh, medic courses, we have um, avalanche rescue courses, theory courses, so several courses. And we also have individual and unit training programs. So we have a four week unit training program called basic cover unit training. That's actually something we made from the experiences we have had in modern part of Norway training with the USC. We think that is a good program. It puts the unit to a place where they can start with the field integration training with other allied units. We also sometimes do mobile training teams and we have a lot of subject matter experts. And we have a website. You can copy on it that on the right hand side. You should find all our Handbooks, lectures, and templates. So that, that is, I guess, the next slide. Yeah, and we have our website. And thank you. Thank you, Knut. Thank you for a very uh, comprehensive uh, introduction to co weather operations and, and the Norwegian and uh, NATO perspective. So I will give the floor um, to. Um, Lieutenant Colonel Anthony Johnson. Um, and I've given him the, the job to cover this from the experience from deploying Marines to Norway. So, please. Thanks, John. Uh, and thank you to, for the invitation to speak today. Just going to share some observations and experience on, on this very important issue. You're probably going to see uh, the correlation to uh, the previous brief, as uh, our experiences are largely, at least my experiences, were largely derived from my time uh, with the Norwegian. So if the conversation, are we ready to fight and win the Arctic conflict? I think you need to begin the conversation with why are we there in the first place, right? So looking at the macro level, we're seeing increasing militarization uh, in the region, dual use facilities, competition for resources. These are drivers. Uh, potentially leading us to conflict. So what might that conflict look like? That's a question that we need to kind of pick around. And what might we be asked to do about it? Some things such as forcible entry or force enabling operations, uh, two, two items that are pretty standard on our mission essential task list. Uh, is this going to be a maritime, air, land, space involved? Uh, we assume Russia's going to be involved, but is China going to be involved too? And how does that impact a potential scenario um, that we may experience in the Arctic. What are the U.S. interests? So as part of the United States military, I think it's important to tie back to what are U.S. interests. Primarily, defend the homeland and protect our treaty allies. Those would be, I think, our two vital interests as we would characterize them. So as we look more from the United States point of view, uh, and we look from west to east, we see Alaska. Um, we can't forget about that in the Bering Strait. We've got our Canadian uh, neighbors to the north, uh, the, 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 the over the pole uh, ballistic missile issue uh, with NORAD uh, and the Northwest Passage, also part of this situation uh, or, or, or context of the problem, if you will. And, and as we continue to the east, uh, we've seen increasing malign encroachment uh, in our near abroad with Greenland, uh, Iceland, and to some extent Nor uh, Norway, um, with, with Chinese moving in to uh, mine for minerals, setting up scientific, scientific research stations and things like that. Uh, and then as we continue to the Northeast, we see kind of the Barents Sea, um, places like the Svalbard area, 
Bear Island and onward to the northern sea route. So uh, from the U.S. perspective, that's what we see. Uh, I think a lot of emphasis is placed primarily uh, towards the Barents Sea, and that is true, but we cannot forget about the scope of the problem for the United States as we approach the Arctic as one of the Arctic Five Nations. The reason we're there in that council is because of Alaska. So it's very important from the U.S. point of view not to forget about that. All right, uh, so that's just general context. And I'll move on. So the, the United States leads the way in, a lot, in many things, uh, but I will say from my point of view, uh, but fighting in the Arctic is not one of them. Uh, we need some humility in this area and be willing to adapt. Uh, which we're usually quite good at, uh, and I think that we can learn from our from our allies and partners, particularly the Norwegians, the Brits, uh, and, and our interactions with the Swedes. Two two issues: um, cold weather versus Arctic. The difference between those two, I think, is your margin of error. Right. So as you describe those two those two environments, one is uncomfortable. You may be a little cold at night. The other one, you lose a hand, you lose a foot, you make mistakes. There are severe consequences very quickly. Cold weather does not equal mountains. Uh, a lot of times we mistake high altitude mountain operations, and we just kind of lump them in with cold weather or Arctic operations. So as we define this problem set, it's important to distinguish that point. <clears throat> you mentioned it uh, in the previous brief. Um, basic surviving conditions versus how do we get to a point where we're good enough to operate there? So the, the difference between surviving and operating, uh, and what are the limits? Uh, it's particularly important to note that within your unit uh, and, and have a good understanding of that. So temperature zones, I think just for general context, you know, we have wet cold, we have dry cold. Wet cold kind of from the 40 to 20 degrees, and I'm speaking Fahrenheit here, not function. Uh, dry cold, you know, you get from 20 to minus 5. And then you get into intense cold, right, uh, down to about minus 25 for us. And then beyond 20, minus 26 and beyond, we're, now we're talking extreme cold uh, conditions. And really the operational limits for our equipment and people at this point uh, is about minus 30, uh, approximately, in that range. There is a limit uh, to which we are reasonably able to operate, and it's important. Uh, to, to think about that and how we might extend that envelope in the future with things like unmanned robots. Uh, it's more than just buying better stock. Right? So I think that's important to to the conversation. Uh, one, one thing that was uh, really impressed upon me in my time in Norway is the difference between individual and collective fuel. I think we speak about cold weather and extreme cold weather uh, in that we, as U.S. forces, tend to operate or tend to focus on training the individual, an individual skill. But Arctic training, and cold weather training, is a collective skill, and 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 the way that you think about that type of training is that it takes everyone involved. It's not that the individual things are not important, but there there is so much more emphasis on unit cohesion and and taking care of each other that it truly is a unit or collective skill. And that's the way I think uh, we should approach it. Our gear and equipment, I'm speaking about the United States, is not set up to perform an Arctic operation. Uh, basic, wet, cold, dry, cold, uh, yes. But um, we don't, you know, the natural fiber clothing has some wet performance, but not the same thermal characteristics. Rough side boots, which I'm wearing right now, um, are stupid, to be perfectly honest with you about it. The Norwegians, everything in their gear set and equipment set is built, I believe, uh, and I don't want to speak for you, but uh, to accommodate this transition from a, a, a warmer, hot to a cold environment. Simple things, like you're able to waterproof your boots, you buy them a size up so you can wear two pairs of socks. Like those are, those are very basic things, uh, but it's not just the boots, it's everything. Everything is designed to make that transition uh, and to make it as seamless as possible. The drying rates of the gear, all these things help you extend the fight longer. Um, Marines will freeze as a result of toughness, and I put that in quotes, 
Um, and so we, as the United States, need to consider how our culture works against us. And it's important to understand uh, and to, as leaders, to, to think about that and address that before we go into these environments. All right, TTPs and tactics don't change, I'll say, much. Uh, but where you do see significant differences is in logistics, medical, communications, the effects on weapons, optics, and munitions. And I'll say in particular, uh, as an example, uh, for instance, mortar, point detonated fuses versus proximity fuses, simple things like that. You know, do we have those in our inventory? Camouflage, PPE considerations, so our personal protective equipment, uh, how that op operates and functions or, or works against our, our cold weather kit. Uh, track plans, avoiding uh, observation, all these are, these are things that, that need to be taken into consideration. I will back you up. Uh, speed is not a thing as far as in the Arctic. Mobility is relative, right? So you got to move slower. It takes planning. It takes deliberate actions on the part of leadership to understand that. And you have to, you, you really have to have kind of a point of reference and an understanding on how that's going to impact your operation. I'll talk about preparatory mission planning. Looking at your assignment, how do you get resourced and scheduled for proper training on the United States side? We're not very good at this um, as far as aligning our assigned mission units uh, and getting them to the proper training, such as the gentleman sits next to me and is going to speak next, getting, getting units that are going into these environments to places where they can, they can prepare the proper preparatory training at Bridgeport, space opportunities in Alaska, and other places. Uh, we just have to be creative and make sure that we as an institution take care of those units and get them the proper training before they go. I will say, you know, going to Bridgeport once also isn't the answer. Um, it takes follow through and continuing to build on those skill sets, which is difficult to do at a place like Camp Lejeune and the swamp of North Carolina, where I came from. Uh, but you have to figure out how you're going to do that. Talking to the Marines about mindset, you mentioned it already. Things like, oh, we're all good, uh, suck it up, that's going to get people hurt, right? Uh, so, those things need to be addressed also by leadership. Now, uh, building a cadre of experts uh, is probably, from a training perspective, a preparatory training perspective, the most important thing that the unit can do. You, because we have personnel turbulence as a thing, right? And the United States Marine Corps, we're not very good at getting units the people they're going to deploy with in a proper amount of time to get that unit cohesive and ready to deploy. We do it, uh, and, and on the backs of the Marines, we're successful. But we don't probably set that unit up for, for success. So um, things like mountain meter scores, uh, snipers, I'll talk a little bit about mountain medicine. Uh, you can get your people into the hospital when you deploy. So wherever you do go, get your medical folks into the hospital to, to get familiar with what's going on there and things like, I don't even know if we still have it, but the Mountain Operation uh, Staff Planning Force. So uh, pre-environmental training when you get there, practicing routine, cohesion, refreshing, medical things, uh, maintenance has been discussed. You've got to think about this. Uh, what does your supply chain look like? Do you have the right oil to put in the truck that, or whatever vehicle uh, on the United States side? We're not real good at that. Mobility, and I'll kind of wrap up, I think, uh, with two final points here. Mobility, wheeled vehicles are not capable of operating in this environment, period stop. Uh, I look across our motor pools, and all I see is things with tires on them. Uh, that's not going to help us out very much. Track vehicles, tanks, if we got rid of AV, CV, snowmobiles, UTVs, sled skis, snowshoes, this is how you get around. And also helos, all right, so our, our tilt rotor, uh, and a support aircraft to help us move around. And I think the final point is, and I'm skipping a few here, but hopefully they'll come up in the Q&A, what does amphibiosity look like in this environment? So we talk a lot about uh, EAVO here. And is that the answer to the bastion defense problem, or is there something different, maybe a local solution uh, that's already uh, being kicked around in Norway and other places? Um, so, no, I'll stop there. Thank you very much for the invitation, and I look forward to any questions.
Thank you, Tony. There's a lot of things to unpack there, and I hope we will get some time to, to do that. And also, that, that there are some some questions from from the chat uh, there later that we can, we can uh, use. So, what I will um, transition over to um, to Colonel Whitnam, uh, and uh, I have I've given his presentation the title of uh, How to Train Marines for Operating in the Arctic: The Marine Perspective. So, sir. Thank you very much. Um, I'll start with a quick. Um a uh, quick ep excerpt here from a German field marshal from 1940, and I'll ask the question at the end of this excerpt, see if we're much different today than we were back then. I'm talking from the U.S. perspective. So this is a uh, field uh, marshal von Brock from the, uh, the Germans that was um, his experiences from World War II that described the pain and suffering of the soldiers on the Eastern Front through the decision by the German high command that led to inadequate cold weather gear and equipment being delivered uh, to his division in uh, the winter 1940 and 41, which was February 41. Ironically, all the German officers that had read, it, read and studied the, uh, Napoleon, the Napoleonic, Napoleonic campaign of 1812, uh, and that was studied in their command staff college. So hopefully we're going to talk about that in your command staff uh, group to here as well. Um, but uh, ultimately, uh, the Germans led to the same demise on the exact same piece of uh, terrain in Russia, uh, outside of Moscow, uh, nearly 140 years later. Uh, when temperatures plummeted to minus 40 to minus 60 degrees Celsius. So it, as uh, Lieutenant Paul Johnson talked about, that would be extreme cold weather, which, uh, which reaches the, uh, the far limits of our, our capability of development. Uh, men within inside this division that were not trained for cold weather, despite being uh, Germans that had grown up in a near-Arctic uh, region, uh, urinated on their own hands to warm them, and their uh, tissue and, uh, instantaneously froze. Through a lack of supplies, primarily stoves, fuel, and, and uh, a lack of training, the division did not have the ability uh, for their soldiers to make their own water. So they were dependent on the, the, the logistics trains to come up, um, which, were, were, which were interdicted in many points. And uh, so they were unable to harvest freshly fallen snow, uh, and they became dehydrated, which directly led to accelerated their loss of physical and cognitive ability. Uh, they were unable to dig survival shelters uh, to get out of the winds that were somewhere around between 70 and 80 miles an hour um, because their entrenching tools broke. Their skin cracked and bled because of the cold, uh, dry wind sweeping across the Russian steppe. Um, these are all things that Napoleon had, had learned uh, back in 1812, um, but weren't uh, obviously understood. So poor logistical planning, poor discipline, disease, all those things led to, to both those armies. An example of logistics, uh, they had soup that was made uh, for the Germans there that would freeze within five minutes of going in the back of the truck that never made it to the troops, period. The tank's engines failed uh, due to inadequate cold weather fuels and preservatives and lubricants. We still see that today. Uh, the recoil, uh, the, the recoil mechanisms on guns froze and breaches broke. I just saw that with an artillery unit up at, uh, at Bridgeport uh, about two weeks ago. Ammunition failed. Radio batteries simply do not function. Fingers froze to exposed metal, no contact gloves. And exhausted soldiers who fell for, during forced marches uh, died in place, and no one had the energy to do anything about it. And they simply died and froze in place, uh, left on the route. So I'd ask ourselves today, you know, based off of what Lieutenant Colonel Johnson, I've got Lieutenant Colonel Gordon here, uh, when we think about what we're doing to prepare for the Arctic, would we be any different today with the level of training that we have in, in, uh, inside the Marine Corps? So my, my job is, you know, I'll, I'll, that's a hypothetical question that I'd like to talk about in, uh, when we get to the question and answer session. So the Marine Corps Mountain Warfare Training Center is in Bridgeport, California. It's been there since 1951 based off of our experiences in the Chosen Reservoir where we lost 7,000 Marines to cold weather injuries. From First Marine Division. First Marine Division was made up of units such as 2 6 from the East Coast and uh, units from 5th and 1st Marine. None of them had cold weather training. Uh, they went over there and they suffered the exact same, um, same issues that we had uh, during the German campaign and uh, during World War II as well. Same thing. Pro, uh, uh, inadequate equipment, were not trained, went directly over there, and, uh, and gentlemen like uh, uh, Chesty Polar bleeding them. So, without question, uh, folks that were well trained and hardy uh, Marines but suffered 7,000 out of 23,000 Marines over there with 1st Marine Division, uh, were wounded without a fight, without even firing their weapon system. Uh, everyone suffered over there. The Chinese lost an entire division, an entire division that came across the border there that was never, that, that not a single soul survived uh, during the Chosen Campaign as well. So they were suffering on both sides. Um, so that is why we have the Marine Corps Mountain Warfare Training Center. We're located in the Eastern Sierra, uh, in the Sierra Nevada, in the northern California, not far from Lake Tahoe. Uh, this location, the uh, chosen location, because it was on the 88 or the 38th parallel, the same as Korea, and 
in its remote, remote locations that has a lot of snow and foul water. That's what Principal Johnson already alluded to, though, that it's a, it's a wet cold. So it's somewhere between 10 degrees and 32 degrees most of the time. We get a lot of snow that's there, so that's beneficial. It's at high altitude between 6,000 and 11,000 feet, but we don't get the intense and extreme cold weather. So even if Lieutenant Colonel Johnson's battalion or Lieutenant Colonel Gordon Meter's uh, um, battalion had come through there, they would not get the same conditions that you get in Alaska uh, or in the high north, which is, a, which is a bit of a training gap that we have right now, uh, although they would get the opportunity to be able to, to, to learn what the uh, they put themselves. Um, the Marine Corps Mountain Warfare Training Center is the only full weather mountainous training, uh, training center that the Marine Corps has. We currently uh, conduct four, four service level training exercises per year, which is a combination of a infantry battalion. We've had infantry regiments that come through there, as well as logistics, combat elements, and aviation units that come through there. It's a 40 day exercise from, uh, from RSO and I to the final after action debrief. Um, and they, what, they, what the units receive there is a, uh, a PNR a training and readiness manual assessment on their core mess when they come through to include offensive and defensive operations. Unlike the Norwegians, the majority of Marines that they come up to, uh, to Bridgeport to go through this training package have never seen cold weather before. Uh, I will reiterate that, have never seen snow before. We're talking Louisiana, Alabama, Mississippi, Florida. You know, and the majority of our Marine Corps uh, grew up in these locations, all right? Um, being stationed at Camp Hilton, Camp Lejeune, North Carolina, 29 Palms, June and Hawaii don't help either. Right, as what Colonel Johnson alluded to, uh, the swamps of Camp Lejeune, where, uh, where I grew up the first half of my career as well, uh, did not allow yourself to become acclimatized. Right, so when you come up the bridge forward, it's quite a shock to the system. So it's really difficult to master the shit that's responsible for full weather based off of how, where we're physically located. I bring that up from the simple standpoint of are we postured correctly? Uh, should we, you have to live hard to be hard. I had the opportunity to be able to grow up in Colorado. It's, it's a wet cold as well. But the things I learned growing up in Colorado, um, and, and uh, spending time in places like Alaska and that kind of stuff, those are, that is exactly what the Norwegians have. They don't have cold weather publications. They just have publications, right, because they live in the cold weather. So they don't have to uh, call that out as a different environment. That's just the way they grow up. Um, so how do we take uh, Marines that have never served in cold weather and get them, uh, get them an experience to go to the Arctic? Uh, we do it in, uh, in a couple of different ways. We do individual skills. So before a unit comes up to the Mountain Warfare Training Center, we offer them classes, not much different than what uh, uh, Knut just uh, described over there. In fact, I think we probably um, borrowed much of your curriculum uh, over here as well. So we have a cold weather leaders course, basic cold weather leaders course, which is just a two-week course to just get people uh, familiar with their kit. We have a mountain leaders course, which is six weeks long for our infantry and our reconnaissance community to learn things like how to, uh, uh, how to predict where avalanche-prone terrain is, uh, how to do advanced infantry tactics. Uh, how to get, not only be able to survive, but to be able to operate in the, uh, the snow-covered environment. We have an engineering uh, course where we talk about how to, uh, to use um, obstacles and barriers to our advantage. We have an animal packers course for expeditionary logistics, a soft and special operations sportsmanship course uh, to teach special operations uh, uh, folks how to use uh, equines. Um, and we have a sniper communication, scout gear, and a mountain operations staff planning course with Terrell Johnson to talk about to train our staff. Okay, so over that 30 or 45 day period, uh, what happens is that individual training, those folks go back to their unit and then they come out for collective skills training. The collective skills training is called mountain exercise. Uh, that's the one that I talked about doing it four times a year. And we basically sort of have three cold weather um, exercises per year. I just finished one the day before yesterday with 2nd Battalion, 4th Marines, um, which was kind of what we call it the shoulder season in October, November. We did have snow during that time frame, but we also had high temperatures in the 50s. So it's was that really cold weather. Uh, we do have one that 3-3 is coming up in, uh, in January, not 3-6, unfortunately, that's going to full response, which highlights some of our issues internally. Uh, we'll train 3-3 that's getting ready to go to UDP to the, uh, the Pacific and may or may not do cold weather training as well. And then we have 3-4 that will be coming up in March, April time frame. Once again, no cold weather training on the schedule. That shows a little bit of our dysfunction. Um, so with that, uh, you know, many of the things that we've talked about with the, uh, the, the German campaign here and, and many of the things we've talked about at the Chosen Reservoir are still the issues that we have today. Do our Marines understand how to use their weapon systems, crew serve weapon systems, advanced land navigation when our peer threats take away our GPS? Uh, we don't allow GPSs to be used up on, on, the, uh, on the hilltops. Um, uh, jam communications, we have that because the complex terrain we have at Bridgeport, uh, but we, uh, we really hit on HF communications. And many of those same skills, the reconnaissance, counter reconnaissance fight, are many of the things that we're really, uh, we're really uh, focused on up here as well. Uh, with that, I will, uh, I will stop there and, uh, and open up the questions. 
So, uh, Knut, uh, thank you for participating from uh, from Norway, uh, and a new gentleman here from, from Cornico, uh, United States, and all of you others. Uh, have a uh, good afternoon and, and evening.